Good morning. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Kendra Rasmussen, the Children's Director here at Bridgepoint Church, and I must take just a moment and give a shout out to those Kids Rock Kids. So good morning, you guys. This morning, we're going to be kicking off a new series called When God Shows Up. We're going to be studying the life of Elijah. Right now, though, let's start off with a little worship. Go ahead and lean in, however that looks for you, whether you hum along, just read the words, or listen. Who breaks the power of sin and darkness? Whose love is mighty and so much stronger? The King of glory, the King above all kings. shakes the whole earth with holy thunder and leaves us breathless in awe and wonder the king of glory the king above all kings this is amazing grace this is unfailing love that you would take my place that you would bear my cross you laid down your life that i would be set free oh jesus i sing for all that you've done for me chaos back into order who makes the orphan a son and daughter the king of glory the king of glory who rules the nations with truth and justice shines like the sun in all of its brilliance the king of glory the king above all kings Now Elijah, who was from Tishbe in Gilead, told King Ahab, As surely as the Lord, the God of Israel, lives, the God I serve, there will be no dew or rain during the next few years until I give word. Then the Lord said to Elijah, Go to the east and hide by Kirith Brook, near where it enters the Jordan River. Drink from the brook and eat what the ravens bring you, for I have commanded them to bring you food. So Elijah did as the Lord told him, and camped beside Kirith Brook, east of the Jordan. 
The ravens brought him bread and meat each morning and evening, and he drank from the brook. But after a while the brook dried up, for there was no rainfall anywhere in the land. Then the Lord said to Elijah, Go and live in the village of Zarephath, near the city of Zidon. I have instructed a widow there to feed you. Hey, welcome everybody. And whether you're joining us on Facebook, YouTube, or maybe listening to the podcast, we are really glad that you're with us. Uh, you know, I, I'm thankful that we have the technology to even make this possible. And you know, it's one thing to have the technology, but it's a whole nother thing to be able to use the technology. So sitting right over here is Jeff Poole. And I just want to thank Jeff for putting all this together and making all this possible. Man, Jeff, thanks for doing everything so that we're able to, uh, to see this and to hear this. Uh, you know, I, I'm thankful for our church. I'm thankful for our staff. I, I think about the children's ministry who are putting things out uh, for the kids and student ministry who they're having, uh, you know, youth group uh, over Zoom, all sorts of different things. I mean, I'm really thankful for an incredible team, an incredible church. I, I'm thankful for you. You've been so generous, and you've prayed for people, and you've served people, and you've been generous in your giving, and wow, it's just an honor to be part of that. And you know what? I'm, I'm even thankful for these two guys right here. You know, yep, here they are, the rank that guys. Now, I don't know if you saw this or not last week, but uh, last week, they ranked the top five overrated movies of all time, and Adam's overrated movie of all time, E.T. And Jonathan's overrated movie of all time, The Dark Knight. Well, I can't tell you how wrong Jonathan is. In fact, both of them are wrong. The number one overrated movie of all time is this. Yep, Titanic. Oh, man. Overrated. Oh, I'll never let you go. I'll never let you go. Bye-bye. I mean, you know, come on. Uh, well, let's get off of that. And uh, let's start this morning with a brand new sermon series, and the title of the sermon series is When God Shows Up. Now, maybe when you hear that, your first reaction is, uh, well, when God shows up, I thought God was everywhere. How can he show up to something? And, you know, technically, you're absolutely right. Uh, God is um, omnipresent. He is everywhere at the same time. But I think what I'm talking about is those times where he shows up, and you absolutely know it. It's unmistakable. I mean, there's no question. He shows up, and what we're going to do over the next few weeks is we're going to see how God shows up in the life of an Old Testament prophet by the name of Elijah. And when we look at uh, all the things that Elijah goes through, I mean, and it is an incredible story. Well, we don't go through the exact same things, but we go through similar things. And those similar things that we go through, we can learn a lot by seeing what Elijah did and then what God did through Elijah. So let's, let's, let's start. If you have a Bible, then uh, take, take your Bible and whether you're opening it up or kind of lighting it up, why don't you look to 1 Kings chapter 17, and while you're turning there, let me give you a little bit of the background. And the background is this. The nation of Israel is a total mess. And in fact, they're no longer one nation, but they have been divided in two separate kingdoms. There is the lower part. It's known as the southern kingdom. That's the kingdom of Judah. And then this upper part, that's the northern kingdom. Well, they're still known as Israel. And over the last 200 years, this northern kingdom, well, they have had 19 kings. And all of those kings have been evil. Now, if you put that in perspective just a little bit, if you think about today and go back 19 presidents in our nation, here's who you end up with. Yep, William Howard Taft. 
And so what that means is, is that for the people in Israel, I mean, they've never known what a good king is like. And um, just when you thought things couldn't get worse, look what 1 Kings 16, verse number 30 says. But Ahab, the son of Omri, did what was evil in the Lord's sight, even more than any of the kings before him. Well, wow. I mean, that's saying something if you are the worst of the 19. And uh, even at that, if that's all there was, that's plenty bad. But there's a multiplier on this. or something that makes it even worse. And that is this. He married Jezebel. And so in this mathematical equation, one plus one, well, it equals about 32. I mean, Jezebel is bad. And even if you don't know much about the Bible, you have heard her name. In fact, her name makes the list of names that nobody would ever name their kids after, right? I mean, take a look at it. Jezebel. Do you know anybody who's named Jezebel? Oh, how about this name? Judas. Nobody names their kid Judas, right? Here's another one. Adolf. Now, no Adolf's running around. And of course, the last one is this one. Cher. What? What? You're pushing back on that? Come on, look around your room. Is there anybody in the room named Cher? Well, no. Let's, let's move on. In 1 Kings 16, 33, it says, Then he, this is King Ahab, he set up an Ashereth pole. Now, now what that is, is that just a, an idol, a place where you would worship uh, false gods. And he did more to provoke the anger of the Lord, the God of Israel, than any of the other kings of Israel before him. And so... Man, it is a sharp downward spiral here. And um, God gets to a point where he's had enough. You know, as much as we think that God is a God of grace and mercy and love, and he absolutely is all of those things, there comes a point where he's not gonna he's not gonna do it anymore. There's a line that gets crossed. And so when Ahab, who has done more evil and has provoked the anger of the Lord than any of the other kings before him, well, God doesn't send an army to take care of it. What God does is he sends Elijah. And what Elijah steps into is uh, a nation that is a complete disaster, a king who is totally rebellious against God, and Elisha is a prophet of God. He's got a message from God that, that God wants him to deliver. And I, I don't know, maybe if you think about, well, a, a prophet of God and man, God's given him a message, you might think that, uh, man, God's with him and that might be a good gig. And what problems could there be with being a prophet? Well, it's always been shoot the messenger. And when you look at the story of Elijah, there are incredible highs and incredible lows. There are unbelievable victories that he's a part of, and there's a lot of defeats as well. So as we begin to study in the life of Elijah, <clears throat> there's a starting point. And the starting point is that God shows up in Elijah's life in a lot of different ways, in this chapter, chapter 17, God shows up in the life of Elijah as a teacher. There are some things that Elijah's going to have to learn. There are some things that he doesn't have any idea about in terms of what's ahead of him. But before he gets to that, there are some things that he has to be taught. You see, every one of us, God knows who we are, and God knows who we can be, but there's a process, and God is going to show up in our lives as well to teach us some things 
because every single one of us have some things that we need to learn. So how about this first point? When God shows up, he teaches me my value. Now you might think, well, that's a kind of an odd place to start, but it's really more important than what we might realize. In the very first verse of chapter 17, it says, now Elisha, who was from Tishbe in Gilead. Well, that's, uh, that's the introduction. This is the first mention of Elisha. And there is nothing that we know about him except for he is from Tishbe. Nothing about his parents, and nothing about his background, nothing about any of those type of things. He just appears. But, but there's something, though. There's something that we can learn about Elijah just from his name. So the name Elijah, in the Hebrew, it means this. The Lord is God. And from his very name, Elijah proclaims the Lord is God. And, and before he even says anything, before he talks to the king, he is declaring just by his name that the Lord is God. You see, Elijah knows God's name. But you know what's more important? God knows Elisha's name. And God knows your name. God knows exactly where you are right now. God knows the circumstances that you're going through. He knows about your finances, your job situation, the relationships that, uh, that are going well, or maybe the relationships that aren't going so well. He knows who you are. He knows your name. He calls out your name. And that voice and that knowledge that God knows who you are, it should just calm us. The New Testament puts it this way, my sheep hear my voice and I know them. It's a little bit like if, uh, you know, with a, with a child and a parent. Once that child hears the parent say his name or her name, a lot of times, you know, if they're not in trouble, it's just calms. It's just something about being secure and knowing that you're in the presence of of your mom or in the presence of your dad and there's safety and security there. And so what God does is that he helps us in terms of knowing what our value is. You may be isolated, but you're not alone. You may be scared, but God is not. You may have a lot of questions, but God knows everything and God knows your name. He knows who you are. He knows your value. Let's finish reading this first verse. Now Elisha, who was from Tishbe in Gilead, told King Ahab, as surely as the Lord, the God of Israel, he lives, the God I serve, there will be no dew or rain during the next few years until I give the word. Now, that is some pretty bold things to say to the most evil king of 19 kings in a row. And what we find out from the New Testament in James chapter 5, verse number 17, is that this time period of no rain, well, oh man, that lasts three and a half years. For an economy that's based on agriculture, I'm telling you, that is not an economic slowdown that is an economic shutdown. I mean, you can imagine, right? No rain means no crops. No crops mean no food. <laughs> no food means there's no jobs, there's no work. And you, spend, you stretch that out over time, then anything that people had saved, any reserves that they had, you know, the stock of things that, uh, they were, that they might have had in storage or in their closet. Well, all that is gone. And what this does is it plunges an entire country into desperation. So, Elisha drops this bomb there with King Ahab. So, he, he, he says what he has to say. And so, 
uh, what we, we don't hear much of anything else in terms of, you know, what Ahab's response was or, you know, anything. Uh, Elijah's being used by God, and so what's next? You might think, okay, so, uh, man, there's going to be a great battle, or Ahab is going to repent, or all these kind of things. But what happens next is unexpected. It's the next couple of verses. Then the Lord said to Elijah, go to the east, and hide by the Kirith Brook near where it enters the Jordan River. Well, you see, he takes Elijah into hiding. He isolates him. The Kirith Brook, that word Kirith means to cut off or to cut down. It is a, a place that it's symbolic of, of being removed from blessing to being isolated. And there, there's something that, that God is wanting to teach Elijah while he is there by this brook. He, he's teaching him his value, but he's also, when God shows up, he teaches me empathy. He, he shows, you know, okay, I need you to understand what it's like for someone to hurt because in order for you to understand that, to have empathy, you have to go through the same thing. Now, why don't you just think about your circumstances for a minute? You may, uh, you may look at those circumstances and think about maybe it's a job or health or relationship or whatever it may be. And, and you're thinking, wow, what did I do to deserve this? And why am I here? And why is there so much pain? And you, there's a lot of questions, and those are all natural. But maybe what is happening is that God is teaching us what we need to learn. And there's no other way to learn it. There's no other way for us to really feel what somebody is going through unless we've gone through it ourselves. There are times when God places us on purpose by ourselves. It's to eliminate the distractions. It's to allow us to hear God's voice without all the, the noise that's going on. And it's also to help us to be able to empathize with people who are going through difficult things as well. Look what 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse number 4 says. He comforts us in all of our troubles. Can we stop right there for a second? I mean, haven't there been some troubles that uh, we've all gone through and God has comforted us? It's those, those times when we didn't know what we were going to do next. We weren't sure what the next day was going to bring. We didn't even know if we could take another breath. But we were comforted in all of our troubles so that we can comfort others. When they are troubled, we will be able to give them the same comfort God has given us. And if you feel like that maybe right now, that where you're located, I mean, I know you're in your living room or, you know, you're somewhere watching this, but you might be able to relate with Elijah and feel like you're sitting by yourself at the Kirith Brook. This is a time that God is using to prepare you to be the best person to help someone else. Uh, this is a time that God is using to mold and to shape you. It, it's a time where you just can't, you, you can't experience what God is wanting to have happen in your life without going through some really difficult things. And we don't like this. But it's absolutely the truth, and that is this. The more God breaks you, and stop there for a second, there are some things that happen that are not just allowed by God. There are some things that happen that are caused by God. Elisha is at this brook because God directed him to be there. The more God breaks you, the more God humbles you, then, the more God is preparing you. 
A.W. Tozer said that a person could not be used by God mightily until he has been hurt mightily. And so what God is doing is God is teaching us. And God is taking Elijah through some things because God knows the future. Elijah doesn't. But there are some lessons that need to be learned. Well, the second thing is this. When God shows up, he teaches me humility. He teaches me humility by being dependent upon God. Look what verse number four says. It says, uh, drink from the brook and eat what the ravens bring you. For I have commanded them to bring you food. So God takes Elijah to this Kirith brook. And he said, okay, you know what? Uh, I'm going to provide for you. It says, so the Elijah did as the Lord told him and camped beside the Kirith brook east of the Jordan. The ravens brought him bread and meat each morning and evening, and he drank from the brook. Well, uh, it's interesting what the Lord is bringing to Elijah. Uh, it is meat and it's bread and there's water there. And it's an unusual delivery method. I mean, the ravens are bringing this to uh, Elijah. But the message of this and the lesson is really clear. In Elijah's life, he's brought to a place and there's a season where he is going to have to totally depend upon God. And that's humbling. You know, when it's not about our resources, our talents, or our uh, abilities, we have to depend upon God. Becky and I were talking the other day, and we were remembering when uh, we first got here to Boise, and, uh, you know, we had a, a youth group, and I was a youth pastor, and it was really some of the best times of our lives. But, um, well, as in every beginning job, uh, the wages uh, weren't exactly uh, abundant, right? And we'd gotten down to the point <clears throat> where we just didn't have any money whatsoever. And uh, we were talking and said, well, you know, what are we going to do about this and what about this and that? And, and we didn't have any money. And in fact, it was kind of so bad, we didn't have any money for toilet paper. Now, it's a little different than today. It's not like, uh, you know, well, the, the shelves were empty. I mean, the shelves had plenty of toilet paper in them. It was the problem that our wallet was empty. We didn't really have resources to be able to buy toilet paper and some other things. So we thought about it and we, we prayed about it. And, uh, you know, we went to bed that night, maybe a little restless, not exactly sure what was going on. And then what we heard was just this big commotion outside. And so, you know, hey, you don't know what's going on, so uh, I get up and, you know, go out to the front door, and what I see is that there are teenagers who are surprised that, you know, I came out the front door, and, man, they're, they're running away, running away, and they had toilet papered our house. And so when Becky and I got out there, we're going, wait a minute, there were like whole packages of toilet paper that had just been dropped in the panic of, you know, being caught and running away. And so we picked those whole uh, packages of toilet paper up and brought them inside. And then we went back outside and all the streamers of toilet paper, they're on the trees. We kind of carefully rolled that back up. And, you know, by the end of the night, we probably had more toilet paper than we've ever had in our entire lives. Now that happened, oh, a few years ago. We've never forgotten it. There is that uh, lesson that we have learned and a lesson I think we can all continue to learn that we can depend upon God. That uh, Elijah is in this place of, of being fed, not with two months supply or three months supply, but actually he is in a place where it's meal by meal. There's a morning delivery and an evening delivery. God will always bring the, his followers to a place where we have to depend upon him for our 
daily bread. We acknowledge that he is first. And if we ever drift from that, if we ever, you know, start depending upon ourselves or depending upon someone else or something else, he'll take us back to the very first commandment of the ten. It says, you shall have no other gods before me. And he'll humble us. He'll humble us to where we realize we really can't do anything in and of ourselves. We have to be dependent upon God. When God shows up, he teaches us humility. When God shows up, he teaches us how to obey. Here's Elisha who had been by this brook for months. You know, I don't know if you've ever watched the television show alone, but this reminds me of that. I'm sure that he has built his shelter now and he's got his water supply and the food's coming in. And he's been there for a while, but then things happen. Look at verse number seven. But after a while, the brook dried up for there was no rainfall anywhere in the land. I mean, we can go back to what he said to King Ahab, right? Not going to be any rain, and there hadn't been for a, a long time. And this brook begins to dry up, and I'm, I'm wondering if he might have thought, "Man, have I have I done something? Have I have I made God mad? Uh, uh, you know, God has provided. I'm depending upon you." Well, he's about to learn another lesson. It's one thing to trust in God when He provides; it's a whole another thing to trust in God when He doesn't. Look at this. It says, God may cause the brook to dry up. Now, it wasn't any accident. This is what God was doing. It's on purpose. God may cause the brook to dry up. And he causes that brook to dry up to give us courage to leave where we are. And look at this next thing. To go where we're supposed to be. You know, the reason some of us are in Boise, Idaho right now is because, well, your brook dried up. I mean, your job changed or your job stopped. There might have been family circumstances or health reasons. If if everything would have just stayed the same, you never would have moved. But those big circumstances those big changes that that we make, well, they're motivated by big events that that wake us up and says, hey, you know what? We better do something. I mean, you you probably heard the old saying that that goes something like this, that, that God guides where God provides. There's probably some truth in that. But what about this? God often guides by what he doesn't provide. And this brook had dried up, and now the lessons that he had learned, it's application time. All of the the stuff that God has taught him, well, now it's going to be tested. All the stuff that God teaches us, I mean, in in your Christian life, the things that that you've learned, uh, I mean, really, what good is it if we don't live it out? And here comes the test. It says, the Lord said to Elijah, Go and live in the village of Zarephath, near the city of Sidon, and I've instructed a widow there to feed you. And so now it's, it's time to change. Elijah has no idea what's about to happen. He's just supposed to get up and go to Zarephath. And this incredible story that continues to play out, well, you should read it for yourself. Maybe when this is over, you could read the rest of chapter 17 and find out all the details of what has happened. But just briefly, with three years with no rain, food is gone and Elijah meets a mom who has a son and this mom is preparing what she thinks is going to be their last meal. Things are so desperate, they are so weak, that they are expecting to die. Look at verse 13. But Elisha said to her, don't be afraid. 
go ahead and do what you've just said. I'm going to gather some sticks. I've got a little oil and some flour. I'm going to make some bread. And then we don't know what we're going to do. Go ahead and do what you've just said, but make a little bread for me first. Then use what is left to prepare a meal for yourself and your son. So as Elisha asks her for some food and tells her that if if she will step out in faith, she'll not run out of food. As you read the story, what you'll find is the flour never gave out and the oil was always there for months and months and months. In fact, the story gets even more incredible. The son does eventually pass away, but Elisha prays, and look in verse number 22. The Lord heard Elisha's prayer, and the life of the child returned, and he revived. Now, it, it, it's, it's incredible all these awesome miracles, and you, well, we could spend so much time talking about all this, and that's why it's really good for you to read the rest and all the details of 1 Kings 17. But I want to close with this. I want you to notice that when Elisha is first introduced, he first comes upon the scene. Here's how he's described. Now, Elisha, who is from Tishbe. Pretty simple description. All it talks about is location. But now you go a little further down the timeline. Look what verse number 24 says. Then the woman told Elisha, Now I know for sure that you are a man of God and that the Lord truly speaks through you. Now it's no, Elisha's no longer known by where he's from. Elisha's known as being a man of God. Of God. And here, here's why this matters, and, and here's where we land. When God shows up in our lives to teach us some things, where we learn the lesson of our value, He knows our name. When we learn the lesson of empathy and how to care for others because we've been through it and we know what it's like, when we learn how to unconditionally obey, and be willing to go through whatever change that God is asking us to to go through. When someone looks at me or someone looks at you or looks at us, of all the things that we are, God brings us to a point where someone sees you and they say, there is a woman of God. Someone sees you and say, well, there is a man of God. And maybe this morning, you've kind of wondered, what exactly is God doing? What's happening? What are the lessons that I'm supposed to learn in the circumstances that I'm in? You might be by your own Kirith Brook. It's super hard, but you know, it's going to be so worth it. Can we pray together? I've got to come to you this morning and just want to acknowledge that all of us, we really need you uh, now. We need you all the time. And we have a lot of questions that we're not sure what the answers are. But God, we acknowledge who you are. We trust in what you're doing. We know that you are shaping us. And God, we know that you'll never leave us or forsake us. Lord, we know that you love us. And may we put ourselves in a place where we learn how much we're valued by you, where we absolutely learn humility and how to obey And God, to know that you are changing us to become more and more like Jesus Christ. We're thankful for what you're doing, no matter how hard it is. Lord, give us the faith and the endurance to be able to see uh, the result. To be able to become the person that you have asked us to become. And we ask this in Christ's name.
Amen. And I don't know, maybe the, with the people that you're with or you might be by yourself, maybe you just spend this little extra time in prayer. But let me speak to somebody, maybe more than one person this morning or maybe just one. Maybe you're in a place where you really are wondering what God is doing and when it comes to a personal relationship with Christ, you don't really know what that's about. You're not sure about what would happen to you if you were to pass away. Well, the good news of the gospel is that Jesus died for you. He resurrected from the grave three days after his death. And he did all that because he loves you so much. In John chapter 3, verse number 16, it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, and that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. You can become a Christian even right where you are at this very moment if you'd be willing to pray a prayer that's like this. Dear God, I know I've done some things wrong. I'm sorry. And I'm asking you to forgive me of my sin. I'm asking you to come into my life and be my Lord and Savior. Thank you for everything that you've done for me. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, if you prayed that prayer, maybe you could uh, let one of the chat hosts know. Or if you have a prayer request or a need, you could text the word NEXT to this number, 208-826-4433. And if you'll do that, somebody will get back to you. We'll be glad to pray with you. Be glad to help you. Be glad to answer questions that you might have. Just anything that we could do to be a help. So now, I want you to listen to this song and let the words of this song speak to you. When peace like a river
As you know, it's more important than ever to stay connected right now, and we have a few ways for you to do that. If you haven't already, text the word LOOP to the number 208-826-4433. That will give you information as we get it as to what's going on here at Bridgepoint. Another way that you can stay connected is through God's Word. We're doing that together, actually, in three different Version studies. If you'd like to be a part of that, Text the word STUDY to the same number, 208-826-4433. If we were currently at Bridgepoint within these walls, you would have a bulletin, and in that bulletin you would have a connection card. Well, good news! In the description below, we have an online connection card. We would just invite all of you to fill that out. Let us know if you have any prayer requests, or if you personally have a need or know someone that does. As a church, we still want to meet the needs of our congregation and also our community. And that happens through your generosity. You can give one of three different ways. One way is through the Church Center app. All you have to do is click the Give tab. Another way is to go to bridgepointchurch.com forward slash giving. Or simply pop a check in the mail to the address on your screen. Whatever way that you decide to give, we are so thankful for your faithfulness. Well, thanks for tuning in this morning. We look forward to having you again next week at 11 o'clock. Hey kids, don't forget to memorize those books of the Bible. We'll see you next week.